This week we're going to learn how to do web scraping. So this is where you take semi-structured or even unstructured data from the web and read it into a proper data structure in Python that you can work with. To do that we're going to use a package called Beautiful Soup and that's something you'll have to install. So we'll do that like we've done with other packages. We'll do Python flag m pip install Beautiful Soup 4. And that should work fine like that. So now it's available. We're going to import requests and then import from B4, sorry, from BS4. This is the Beautiful Soup 4 package. Import Beautiful Soup with that capitalization. So that's going to give us this package. Beautiful Soup is a uh, module for Python that. Uh, basically allows you to easily process HTML so you don't have to write your own code to read all of the tags and look at what their attributes are and understand their nesting. In this lecture we're going to work through an example uh, that someone posted online that I've also linked for you in the readings and so we're going to use their uh, data file and let's take a quick look at that first. So this is the tutorial that we're going to work through, how to web scrape with Python in four minutes. We are going to spend a lot longer than four minutes on it. Um, but the data that they're using here is turnstile data from uh, the New York MTA. So if we visit that data source, what you can see is that there's a bunch of data files here each day, uh, or I guess each week has a file. And if you click on it, it takes you to a text file. These are comma separated values and that gives you all of the data that you need. You can see the headers up here. So if we wanted to say go through and read all of this data, you can't just read one file in because one file only has a week's worth of data. So what you need to do is go to this page and follow every link to the actual text files that have the data. So what a web scraper is going to do for us is allow us to look at this page that we're looking at in the browser now to extract the links that go from the days here to the actual data files and then we have a list of online text files that we can then read in and process. So the, uh, the text files here we don't need to do any web scraping. This is just plain text and so you would just open these files, you'd go through them line by line you'd split on the comma like we've done in earlier examples this semester and then put those into either an object if you create a class for this data or some other kind of data structure. But to read this page, this is an HTML page and that's going to require us to do some web scraping. So we're going to take a look at the source of this page. Remember you can do that with command or control U or you can find view source in one of the menus. And you can see we have all this HTML in here lots of stuff, but somewhere in here are the dates and in fact they're kind of buried in here in one very long line that has every single one of those dates with a link. So uh, we know we're kind of looking for this a href equals and then linking to a text file. There's going to be other a href in here, that's how you do links in HTML and you can see there's some of them up here and so we want to find the ones that just go um, to those text files. So this is the page that we're going to start reading in. So let's switch back over to our code and what we want to do, I'll copy this first, is copy the URL for this page because we're going to read that in from the web. So we're going to say page equals requests.get and then the URL. Now remember this is just what we did last week. Request is our package here that lets us pull data from the web you do requests.get and then a URL and that will pull the page down for you. Let's save this as html.py and then we'll just do print page to incrementally work on this and make sure it's okay. So python html.py Okay, and we have an error in here. It looks like a beautiful soup was the issue. All right, I just tried to debug that problem uh, and it was much more complicated than I thought it was. The issue turns out that you can't name your file html.py because beautiful soup uses something called that and it gets confused. 
So I have changed the name of this file to html2.py. Uh, normally I show you all my debugging process. I'm not going to do that here because it involved like a bunch of Reddit forums and, and a little bit of a mess. Um, but you know, always new stuff when we're going through this. So change the name of your file to html2 or something .py, just not plain old html.py. And now if we run that, uh, we get this response 200, which means our page was successfully accessed. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is use beautiful soup to actually parse this page. So we're going to use soup as our variable name and set that equal to beautiful soup. And then we're going to do page.text. Remember that gets the text of the page that we're looking at. And then in quotes, we're going to do html.parser. This is something that beautiful soup has access to and it says exactly what you'd expect. Use the HTML parser to analyze the text of page, which is our variable here. And the result of that is going to be stored in soup. Now soup is going to be an object that uh, beautiful soup has defined. And so it's going to have its own methods and attributes. Just to make sure that's working, let's print soup. Okay, so big mess of HTML printing out here, but no errors. And so now we know our code is working. And we can actually turn towards using some of the features of Beautiful Soup to process the HTML. Remember, on the page that we're looking at here, we want to pull out all the links. So to find tags, you can do soup.findall, and then you put the tag name in quotes on the inside. So for example, we could do img, and that will find all the images, anything in an img tag. So let's print soup find all img. I don't even know if there are images on this page, but we'll see if that gives us anything. Okay, and we can see that we've, we're getting a few image tags here. This is one, here's another one, and here's another one. So we're getting the HTML. You can see that this is a list because it has square brackets around it. And so um, if we save this as images in a variable, we could print images square bracket zero, and that will give us the first one of these. So it's taking a second here. Um, again, we talked about this last time. You'll sometimes get a delay because it's accessing the page. But you can see when we changed our code, it's printing out just element zero. That's printing out the first item that was in our list here. So what you get back from this find all is a list that has all of the tags that um, start with or that you know you have the tag name that you specify here so we've done images in this case uh, but what we're really interested in is all the links so let's call that links and instead of uh, looking for IMG we're gonna look for a now that's not just looking for the letter a that's looking for the tag named a so you have a less than sign and then an a and then a space uh, so let's just print that whole list to see this working. Okay, so we get a big dump of all of the links and you can tell that this is right from having looked at that page that pretty much all of these are dates that are linking to text files. If we were to scroll all the way to the top and this is gonna be pretty long, um, we'll see that there are also some other links towards the top here um, going for example to the MTA Capital Program, planned service changes, other links that are on the page. All right, so the question is, how do we go from this mess of links to just the links that we want? So we know there's a bunch of extraneous ones at the top. Uh, if we go all the way down to the bottom, the, everything all the way to the bottom is relevant. So once we get into the tags that are linking to these data files, we know that all the rest of the links are going to go to data files. So all we need to do is find where those start. There's not a great automated way to do this because this is not structured data. Um, we could call it semi-structured, but basically you have to do some work by hand when you're analyzing web pages. So what I did is I copied the top of that output. I'm just going to paste it into a document here. Uh, this is how I do a ton of work myself. I do a lot of web scraping in my research, and this is the process that I use. So what we've got here is a bunch of links, and we can see they're separated by commas in this list. So I'm going to just replace every comma with a new line. If you're using any of the text editors I recommended, they have the ability to do this. And we do replace all. 
And then we see we've got a list here and our lines are numbered. And so I can see line 37 is the first line that uh, is actually linking to one of these text files. So this is a list and we start at line one. So 37 is the line that has the first of the text files, but because our index starts at zero, it's gonna be index 36. Uh, so we know once we get to 36, then everything after that is gonna be a link to a text file. So we'll say I is gonna start at 36. We can comment out this printing for now. And then we can say while I is less than the length of links, um, and we, it's starting at 36, let's print links square bracket I. So we're starting at the 36th element and we're going to go all the way down to the end. Again, I have forgotten my colon here. Eventually I'll learn to do that automatically. Um, and so what this should print for us is a list of links to all those text files. So let's try that. All right, so this is looking pretty good. Um, it's not looking pretty good. All right, I'm going to cancel this. We are stuck in an infinite loop here and that's because I just said while i is less than the length of links and I didn't do anything to increment it. So we'll say i equals i plus one. Now it should work a little bit better. Okay, great. So there we get all of our links. But the interesting thing here is that these links, they look like they're just printing like text now, right? We're printing links of i and it's printing out some nice text for us, but this is actually an object. So we can do square brackets href after links of i and what that's going to do is get us just the text that's inside the href attribute of the html so if we flip back here and look at our links you can see we have href equals and then the url of the actual file is in there so once we've changed our code to have this href at the end it's going to pull out just the text that's in the href attribute there. So let's make sure we saved this, switch back to our code, run it again, and now we're getting just those text files. Uh, we're missing the beginning of this URL because it's their relative links. Um, we would, if we wanted to fetch those, replace that with uh, this part up here, and that would actually get us to the files. But what we've done now is to successfully scrape this page and get the content that we want. And this is really wonderful stuff that you get from Beautiful Soup. Um, normally when I am scraping HTML, I'm actually writing my own code to like look for particular tags, to pull out the attributes, writing a lot of regular expressions, which are wonderful, but very complicated. Um, so Beautiful Soup gives you a really nice way to be able to parse those pages. So if you wanna actually use this, if we wanna go get all of that turnstile data, uh, what we're going to do is we need this part for the full URL and so we can say instead of printing this we'll say the URL is that front part and then uh, concatenate on links of i href uh, and then let's just print URL for now to see that working. So if I run it again now you can see we've got the full URL Let's copy that and paste this into our browser to make sure it works. We can see there's a data file there. Now, once we have that URL, we can actually go get that URL, right? We can do requests.get URL. But when you're doing that for a website, first you want to make sure that what you're doing on the website is allowed and you're not just pulling a bunch of data. Uh, without them approving it, they will catch you very quickly if you do that. And it's kind of a jerk move to just be scraping websites that don't allow it. The other thing is that this code will run very fast and uh, that can be aggressive on a website. And so putting in a delay of like one second between requests is a pretty good uh, kind of kind thing to do when you're scraping websites that allow it. So to do that, we're going to import this module time and then put time.sleep and then you put a number of seconds in parentheses and so what this does is just pauses your code for however many seconds, one second in this case, um, 
And when you're scraping web pages, that keeps you from just hitting pages over and over and over again. Uh, I often use longer delays than that, five or six seconds, um, because you can let your code run overnight. It's much nicer to the website to not get hammered with requests. And, uh, and so this would allow us to extract the URL from the page and then fetch the URL that actually has the data. We'll pause, we're doing some administrative stuff here, and then we can handle the data. So in this case, we probably would do split a few times and then chop that up and put it into, for example, an object. Um, and that allows us to save all of the data that's stored there. So let's take a look at what we might do. So here's all of this data. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here and we don't really know what all of it is. Uh, this particular file does not have uh, headers on it. Some of the other ones did. Okay, so let's just start going through that by line. So here we're doing, I'm going to bump all of this down. Um, we'll handle our data up here. So we'll say that data is equal to requests.get. And then we'll say for line in data.text. Let's just print the lines um, to make sure that we're actually getting each line of the file. Uh, and for now, I'm gonna, we're gonna be a little bit nicer to this page. We're gonna say i equals to 36, and then I'll say, well, i is less than 37, so we're not gonna be hitting the page over and over again. This is really important etiquette of scraping web pages. Uh, you don't wanna just hammer servers with requests. They will detect you, they will block you, even if you're allowed to grab the data. It's just impolite to do it, especially while you're testing your code. Um, you should never be sending lots of requests to a server while you're testing your code. And, uh, you know, I've been blocked plenty of times for doing this in the wrong way. So I want you to kind of instill this as an ethic as you're learning to program this stuff. So this is just going to get one of those files and parse it out. And so we'll be able to see the lines. And I'm going to preface this with just the word line so we know that we're actually processing one line at a time. Okay, so let's run that. And so I have a typo here. Again, I forgot my colon. Sorry. Hopefully you guys are catching that before me at this point. Okay, and again, it's pausing here because it's fetching the file for us. And that might be a really big file because it's taking a long time. Let's flip over there. Uh, oh, this is a huge file. So we picked like the worst one. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, what a mess that we've got going on here. Um, so we, this message at the bottom is just because I hit Control C to cancel it. Um, it's printing each character on its own line. And so our loop here is not very effective. So let's make a couple changes. Um, first, we're going to go here. Um, actually, let's change our code. So number 37 uh, is giving us that file that we were just looking at. Sorry, go back here, uh, which is a huge file. That's not good. We don't want to be getting the biggest file possible. So uh, let's try instead of this, we'll set i equal to the length of links minus one. So that's going to give us basically the last index. And then I'll say while i is less than the length of links, so we're still just going to do one, but it's going to give us a smaller file, hopefully. Um, let's actually just try it like that to make sure that works. Okay, so while it's loading, let's look at this file and see if that's any better. Uh, we're getting sort of a slow response. Still a pretty big file. So we should expect pretty much the same result, which is it'll take a while. And uh, this just came up because I canceled it. Um, so it's giving us a lot of messages. So, all right. So that's not quite working the way we wanted because it's not going one line at a time. So we know that this loop for line in data.txt, even though I called it a line, what that is actually doing with this for loop is getting us one character at a time, which is not what we want. 
So there actually is a way to do that. Um, we do data.txt dot uh, split lines and that's going to break up that big blob of text into lines and so we should get one line at a time. So let's try that code again. Okay and we can see that this is working. It's got my text line and then it's got a bunch of data and then we can see it starts another line down here. So now we're actually going line by line through the file and, uh, and that's getting stored in this variable line right here. Now, what do we do with this data? Instead of just printing it out, this is comma separated data. And so we know how to do that. We know how to split on a comma. So we can say, um, we'll call it info since we, data is already a variable. Info is going to be split on a comma. And then we need to attach that to our line. So we'll do line dot split on a comma. Um, that means each thing in that line is going to be split up where there's a comma. Info becomes a list that has that. So I could print now just to test this info bracket zero, which should print the first piece of data in each line for us. So if we flip back over to run this, we can see that after my word line, we usually have like an S102, S102, um, S101A, so we should be seeing S and then some numbers uh, if this is working right. Okay, and that seemed to work great. So now we know we have all of that data in uh, a list called info and we can store either all of it in uh, say an object, in a master list, or we can pick out fields that we care about. Uh, it's, you can certainly use station entries and exits in both places, but for students, it can get a little confusing when they match. So I'm going to give them that in. There's no magic to this. It's just something to distinguish the name. And then we're going to say self.station equals station in self.entries equals entries in and self.exits equals exits. in. Um, now, we may want to think about what's the right way to do this. Um, here we're essentially creating one station data object for each line in a file. This is not going to aggregate entries and exits for a certain station. Um, so we're going to have the same station show up multiple times. Um, it's going to show up multiple times that have multiple instances. You can certainly create this and you'll want to think about how to do that where um, instead of creating a new entry for each piece of data, you're going to create, um, you're going to sort of have like one station with information and then you might sum up all the entries and exits. You might create um, instances for different days. But for now, this is going to work fine just to get the idea of creating an object to store our data. So we'll have station data, we'll initialize that. And then um, for each line, instead of printing all of this, we'll have, um, so we'll use SD as our variable, is station data. And then we're going to give it those three pieces of data. So we don't have to print any of this anymore. I'll just comment that out. So that's creating our objects. And then we may want, you know, this variable SD is going to get overwritten each time we go through. So I may want to have a list called data. Uh, I'm already using data, so we'll call it uh, my station data will be an empty list. And then instead of having a variable, we can say my station data dot append this new object. This should look familiar. This is something that you've had to do in the homeworks. And so when we're done running all of this, what we'll end up with is a list of all the station data objects that we've created for each line in all of the files that we will loop through if we start this at 36. So that's a sort of extended version of a web scraping tutorial that shows you how to combine some object-oriented programming, um, some ways to get data from the web, along with this beautiful soup module that you can parse, 
and showing you how you have to do some work by hand to just count things and understand the structure of documents.